let me give you the background on this particular one. This is AppSec Champions. And uh, when the pandemic started last year, we had gone through this process of, of you know, really transitioning to Zoom calls and not travel. And we were, we, we had just rolled off of RSA 2021. And I think Black Hat had been canceled in person. So this is like late spring, early summer. And we're just trying to think of things to do that were interesting intellectually. And uh, this was one of the things that came out of that. It was an idea that, uh, that AppSec Champions, which we had known and seen and, and experienced and worked with numerous uh, companies on this, had never, the whole concept had never really been measured in any way. And that even though these, this whole concept of a Champions program was a thing, it, nobody had ever quantified the numbers. So this was an idea to do that. Uh, and I'll, go, I'll give you the quick background of what we did. And it was a, a tremendous lift. It took the better part of last year and up to this spring. And, uh, and, and it will, you know, for those that are AppSec people and AppSec managers, this is real, real stuff uh, that can help. Well, my background, uh, AppSec person forever. I've been in the business for about 22 years. Uh, and pro primarily what I do is I help AppSec managers with these programs and I'm an advisor on software risk for CISOs and CSOs. That's, that's primarily what I do. Uh, the vast majority of CISOs are not developers or AppSec people by background. So I end up being that translation layer uh, between the hardcore OWASP and AppSec, uh, you know, energies and activities to a uh, less technical non-developer uh, leadership. So making the business case for this stuff. So do a lot of speaking. And this was the project that we ended up doing. I said, this is a cool one. I also did a, for two or three years in a row, uh, a, a surveys on developers and the impact of training and presented those at numerous uh, AppSec USAs, uh, probably now about six or seven years ago. So I did uh, developer uh, surveys on the impact of, of uh, you know, a, a, a security class and uh, on their you know ability to to write more secure code. So let me talk about the the survey itself. As I mentioned, it was something that we came up with, and it became a thing. It became a big deal. We way underestimated how much time and energy was put into this. My original background and my original undergraduate degree was political science, so I had a, a at least a technical bent from a, a survey and questionnaire standpoint and how to collect data. I'm also an MBA uh, person, so you know, technical and from a business standpoint and from a number crunching standpoint, and knew how to develop a hypothesis and questions that could be measured. So um, what I'll talk about today is the survey itself, the questions that I asked and how I asked them, the preliminary results or the results that, that came out of the study, and then leave enough time for questions and answers, I hope. Uh, so the first thing I did is we, we did what's called a structured research approach, which involved a set of interviews because I recognized that, that you know, yes, you could send out a, you know, a survey monkey and get certain sets of data back, which were interesting, but given the early stage nature and kind of the emerging stage nature of uh, AFSIC champions, that maybe some of the more interesting observations would be uh, from follow-on questions. So what I ended up doing is having a series of interviews and really picking uh, the, the programs was part of it because I wanted to not get sample bias. And so I'll talk about that a bit. Uh, but we wanted to really capture the best practices, stuff that we saw in the field, the common practices, um, identify some of the common challenges, things that people experience and put numbers to that. And then try to see if there's any commonalities out there around you know, pipelines, cloud, security demands, like the organization itself. And, uh, the, you know, so what we ended up doing is we focused on people that are AppSec managers, people that are program owners, subject matter experts, and regardless of their title, regardless of their role, and that was the starting point, like people that knew this stuff that had a program. So, so if they didn't have a program, we threw them out. Or one that was very interesting, if they, called it an AppSec Champions program it was a glorified developer training program. We threw that out too. So you know, perhaps the starting point for the, the discussion is an AppSec Champions program itself is the use of a centralized security team, typically reporting to the security organization that is using concepts of influence and managerial leverage 
to influence a much larger uh, development team that doesn't report to them. Uh, so absent of formal kind of uh, command and control, as they say, uh, not ability to compel them to do a lot, but the use of a, you know, a small a tight knit team to influence uh, lots more people. So what I ended up doing is uh, having several interviews, teeing it up, getting the business justification, getting them to participate. Because here's the other thing, if you deal with big companies, not all of them want to share data, any data. You know, so we had a few that were very interested to be great uh, members. I probably talked to 50 companies. Um, I ended up getting 26 uh, that I got. I went through this whole drill with. But like there was a lot of people that didn't, you know, they couldn't get corporate you know, their CISO or couldn't get corporate PR to do this. So they, their corporate policy wasn't to participate. So, again, the output would be a research report and a published white paper, which I've got uh, a final draft of. And that's one of the things that if you're interested in this topic, um, I'm publishing that in the next 30 days. So um, I'll, uh, the, the background is I had it mostly done uh, in the spring after working on it all last year. I did the writing and iterations, and then we got bought out by Coal Fire, did them, group did. And the marketing folks were like, wait a second, this is kind of cool to, to send out. So they put it on their marketing um, uh, you know, docket and embargoed it. And here we are, it's November. So I'm like anxious to get it out, but it's pretty cool. You like it if you're interested. So, so the candidates for the survey, like again, you know, given the bias of sample sampling, I wanted to focus on a few common attributes for the starting point. Again, that they had a full-time application security staff, you know, regardless of what their job titles were, they had somebody that manage the risk of software full time. And that that throws a lot of companies out. And I said, as I mentioned earlier, we did 26 that were either building at the earlier stages or built. If I if I got people that were thinking about it, everything would be zeros. Uh, so there were a few in there that were at earlier stages. Uh, the industries were represented, as you might imagine, uh, are some of the larger ones that had complex uh, development efforts. They had lots and lots of teams uh, that probably regulated, certainly had supply chain pressures. So that's the pharmas, banks, tech, telecom, uh, financial services, no public sector, so no governments, um, not a really small, medium-sized business. The smaller companies probably were more SaaS and you know had more of a SaaS or like fintech flavor to them, if that makes sense. They, they, they didn't have 10,000 seats or 10,000 people, but they were super paranoid because that's what they did. So over 50% of the, the 26 had 10,000 seats or above. So these are big pro, you know, at big AppSec programs where the use case probably is five or six or seven uh, AppSec people, um, you know, and then thousands of developers. So one of the questions I asked, I'll get to, is what's that ratio between the two? Because I thought that was interesting. So that's the background of the candidates for the survey. And as I mentioned, um, I had to get to talk about 50 to get to 26. And um, as I mentioned, there's a few in there that, you know, I'm like very promising candidates that were like, oh, wait a second, that's just a, a training program. Uh, and they didn't have any other components of AppSec Champion stuff. So I asked four types of questions. And again, like when you go in to do one of these things, you have certain hypotheses and certain um, ideas. And given that I've been an app second and worked with companies and programs, I had, you know, this was not the first time I'd done this. I had some idea. Um, some of the questions turned out to be more interesting, or the responses turned out to be more interesting than others. But the first set of questions are around the organizations itself. You know, more than how many devs, how many AppSec people, how many teams, you know, where did they kind of think they were maturity-wise, you know, on, on a kind of bastardized CMMI schedule, you know, uh, uh, you know, maturity level. Uh, I, also about, about environments, about how many, you know, had, had pipelines and cloud, you know, how many were having their apps uh, resident in the cloud or, you know, like look more traditional on-prem. I asked two questions about times, time, how long did these programs take to build? How long had they been in place? And I got some interesting answers there that I didn't anticipate uh, to be quite candid. I asked about program attributes itself. Did they have a mandate? Did this, did it look like, uh, the uh, trusted computing memo from Bill Gates over 20 years ago, where Bill Gates woke up one day and said, thou shalt write software more securely, or did it come up organically from the development team as a comparison? Were there standards in place? How did these organizations recruit AppSec champions from the dev teams? 
Was there training and tools? And again, this is interesting because in order to accrue the value of scale, and again, we're talking scalability and leverage here because you have a handful of people trying to influence potentially thousands. Without that proper set of tools and documentation, it's all an anecdote. And so I asked questions around then, and then around that, and then I asked two questions around ROI that were very simple and broad. Uh, you know, are you achieving results, and if so, how do you measure those results in an ROI fashion? The thing that came out of this is most certainly there is, uh, you know, areas for future research and additional questions, and there is some sense that we'll probably end up doing this again because there's just so much left on the table, and I'll get that sense hopefully in the questions and answers that'll come out. Um, so. This is an interesting one. The first question I asked around organizational background was like, how do you characterize your AppSec Champions program? And I gave some attributes of this. And one of them I asked was, you know, like, like, do you consider yourself, mature, you know, maturing? And they're, you know, like, like, are you doing regular scanning? If you looked at like a BSIM or OpenSAM, where do you feel like you are? Have you done that at all? Um, so I gave some broad, you know, editorial discretion here. And um, in, in these questions, if they, told me that they looked a particular way and then the rest of the responses didn't look that way, I would go back and double back. Like it's, if they said, oh yeah, we're optimizing and they're using like one uh, DAS scanner and not doing anything else, no threat modeling, no requirements, no val, you know, no. Uh, so I, there's, you know, some sanity there. So that was the first thing. Um, so the average, most of the people said that they were maturing. Uh, some of the newer ones said they were emerging as you might imagine. There were only two or three, I think in the whole, uh, survey that said they were mature. There was none above that. So interesting. Okay, so here's the numbers that came out from the, the 26 companies. How many developers do you have? A average, the mean was about 1600, which is a number that really doesn't mean a lot, right? Because there's a lot of variance. It's like there's lots so thousands, in, or in this case, in nearly 2000. So, but a, a picture is starting to emerge here. How many AppSec staff do you typically have? 13. And in that if you look at the small organizations, it's like, okay, it, the use case of handful of AppSec people that hundreds or thousands of developers started to come out from this. The other one I asked that really was almost a, a, not a throwaway question, but like didn't really have any meaning is how many champions did you have? This was all over the place, depending on how, uh, you know, how they allocated them across teams. So it didn't really tell me much and probably um, begs further analysis. I did ask how many dev teams they had in general. And what I came to find out is sure enough, there's like cross matricing and, and double counting problems. So I just threw that one out as a, it did, just didn't strike me as interesting. But the thing that did was in the programs that self-identified as mature, they had a one to 50 AppSec person to developer ratio. And if you throw in the maturing ones, that goes to one, one to 150 to one to 100. And then after that, it was all over the place, right? But like the mature maturing programs were quite interesting. The ones that looked, had other attributes of goodness. Um, and I, my understanding is that it does track with what the guys at Synopsys have seen in their BSIM uh, question. So I think it's pretty cool. So that's a, a key finding that comes out in the report is like, hey, it's one to 50. You know, it's a number. Um, that is one that I want to do again, because that, that jumped out and I didn't expect that to be as cool as it was. Okay. So we looked at other aspects of testing to infer sophistication too. Um, we asked, you know, like what kind of tools and, and uh, tool sets did they ask? Uh, we asked how many apps were built in pipelines or distributed, I should built and distributed through pipelines. So about 61% said over half. So, but that was almost all of them said, of course, that's moving that way. Um, interesting, the, the, the people that were pretty much uh, more traditional, certainly as it related to cloud, were the on -prem, the bigger on-prem financial banks, the big banks. Um, but this is certainly going towards, um, you know, the, 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 as you might imagine, pipelines in, in, in the cloud. Uh, what percentage of your apps were hosted in the cloud? It was divided. 38% um, over, said over 90. So that's an example. But the key finding that jumped out at us is everybody that said that they were mature uh, had all three types of major testing uh, technologies. And a lot of them had IS too. So I don't get an email from the guys at Contrast and Sonotype in different places like that. It was the, the key point here as, as analysts and others have said is you, you 
it, to really infer truth, you have to have two or three types of technology, certainly SAS and DAS, probably SCA, even better with IAST, um, and then and then go from there. So that that bore out in these numbers is the mature ones had that, and um, and that was one of the key findings that came out. So, all right. Uh, so here is an area that I asked around uh, the time. How long did it take to build these programs? And about, a, like, it's somewhere between a year, about half of them said about a year, up to a year. Um, and then about 20% said one plus year. Uh, and it's all over the place. But it's safe to say to get, if you start tomorrow, it's at least a year in probably a year to two years, uh, realistically, to have coverage across the teams, to have material impact and feedback from the teams. And, uh, but so that's about a, you know, a year. Now, the interesting one, uh, I asked the next question, well, wait, I probably, I probably should ask the other one first. I said, like, how long have these programs been in place? Sure enough, we had a few that have been out there in the FinTech and financial area, for over four years, and it had multiple iterations. Uh, the you know the majority were somewhere in there two to three years or a year, but a good twenty seven percent said NA. What that really was was they didn't know, and uh, so that's reflective of substantial turnover, as you might imagine, as you probably have experienced anecdotally, um, substantial pro uh, progress. Uh, excuse me, turnover from, from developers and AppSec people. They just didn't know. The other thing that came out as a secondary question that I didn't anticipate here, and I included in the report, was about the issue about uh, programs that's, that had complete resets. Um, and just a little bit of a sidebar here, when I mean a complete reset, where they were off and running for two years and then had a key person leave or had a leadership focus change or, I mean, who knows, maybe even a, a security incident, but they completely lost somebody and it was a do-over. My assumption going in was that these things always were going to be growing and doing better and expanding and having depth of coverage. And that is, in fact, not the case. In a, in a, in a big chunk of the organizations, they have total reset. So that's a, in the report itself, I put a, a, a little aside to managers. It's like, these take care and feeding. Like, don't assume that they'll have organizational momentum. So just an FYI. So another interesting thing, you know, going in a hypothesis was that these things kind of happen organically. It's, you know, the, the Bill Gates memo is, a, is an example where uh, maybe not so much, where he had strong, like, hierarchical or, down, you know, chain of command guidance, but not so much in, this, in, the, in the report. Uh, the at least two thirds said they had nothing or uh, they had the CISO mandate. Well, I mean, like, let's be candid. If you don't have the CISO mandate, you don't have anything. So like, that's almost a thing, you know, like a <laughs> existential. Yes, of course we had the, the CISO mandate. But the point here is that most of them happened organically. Ironically, these uh, organizations have these, you know, very smart technical leaders who become, you know, hack the organization from within. And, and grew it, uh, these programs with, in many instances, very little uh, managerial oversight with very little investment and certainly with little or no uh, mandate, formal mandate. So I think that's pretty cool. Like they, they become a thing uh, without it you know, being a thing at the CEO, CFO, CEO level. And I did ask that question. I think we only had one that had um, the COO, the rest were the CTO, Okay, that's that's now we're talking. That's where the development lived in that organization, but I think there was only one that had CFO, C, uh, CTO, excuse me, CFO, COO, or CEO. And there were none that had CEO. So this is an important thing to recognize. Somewhere in the in your journey, you have to have that. You know, if you don't get it, you should go back two years into it and try to get it. So just a little aside. Uh, some other program attributes. Uh, do you have defined roles and uh, standards? I asked that question. And, you know, majority said they did, but it was kind of a, I was expecting higher in that. 62% they said. And the question there is like, if you don't have defined roles and standards, how do you scale this program? How do you communicate across all the dev teams? Is it tribal knowledge? Is it conversation? Is it oral history? <laughs> like, like, how do you do that? 
Uh, the other thing is, I asked the question, like, how did you recruit? And uh, the that, the majority there, it's, I, it's, I sussed this out in the report, but we're volunteered and voluntold. The assumption here is that the best way to do this is to have them volunteer to be bought, bought in and not be told, you know, uh, but between those two, uh, that largely is the way you recruit. The preference by far is volunteered. If you, uh, and there's a whole series of discussions, and I think one of my colleagues presented on how you build and recruit. Uh, I didn't get to see that, but I'm going to. Um, and then you have a format for formal training, like is there an approach? Like the majority didn't, nor did they have actual rewards programs. And this is when I say rewards, I mean, you know, a formal recognition program broadly. So if you don't have a formal training program, again, how do you scale? How do you do it? Um, that, that was a little bit surprising. The rewards one is an opportunity missed, I would say. And rewards doesn't mean purely monetary or recognition, but the more sophisticated organizations did in fact make it into, uh, into their performance management system, you know, into their ratings as, as, as attributes. Um, they also did formalized recognition, even if it wasn't monetary, like uh, through peer recognition, through whatever, just like, hey, great job, through gamification. Uh, that's a, that's a, I think, a table stake, to be quite candid, and probably further, you know, a, a, an opportunity for further discussion and analysis. Okay, so how frequently did these leaders, the AppSec leaders, communicate with their champions? Most were constantly, most, and then at a minimum monthly, right? So it was interesting because we asked this question, a lot of it's ad hoc too. And you can say, well, okay, we used uh, Slack. Okay, of course, everybody used Slack or, or the equivalent, Slack or Teams, right? But, um, you know, so, so 64 used Slack and Teams. Some had some pretty cool portals that they used. Um, you know, so the, the gamification stuff, uh, some of them use some of the platforms that you might imagine, the typical tooling that, that, that help provide visibility across the teams. But the interesting thing that, that came out of this, that's in the report that I didn't really capture in this uh, presentation was a recognition that you have to have Slack and Teams for kind of the day-to-day -day chatter, but that doesn't substitute a formal communication strategy to the, to the masses. So almost all of them use Slack and Teams for day-to-day -day -day chatter, and back and forth and more direct guidance. But that was complemented by either a monthly newsletter or email or an in-person town hall type deal where they could do recognition and stuff. So those, so put that in there as a key thing to remember if you're rolling out these programs is yes, you have to have Slack and Teams and day-to-day -day, uh, channels to provide prescriptive guidance and scalability, but you also have to have that the human part, which is the communication. Um, okay, so I'm going to leave enough time. I'm going to capture two or three more things and then jump into questions and answers. Are you achieving your desired outcomes? This was the area that um, I suspected would turn out this way, uh, but was still disappointed. So 42% said they were, but like those were soft, uh, it was soft responses. And uh, for several of the product security companies and fintech companies, they said, yeah, we feel that we have, but we've never got that acknowledgement from our buyers, for our clients, which would be more, be stronger. Some of the um, anecdotes that came out of this section or included the report were pretty slick. Uh, for example, a fintech CISO who said, wait a second, I was asked on a due diligence call by one of the big four banks about our AppSec pro uh, program and then the AppSec champions specifically. He just totally like, hey, well, you guys have an AppSec champions program? And he, went into a little discussion. Uh, sure enough, they won the big, huge contract for that big bank. And uh, the sales VP was like, I don't know what that AppSec Champions program is, but keep doing that. You know, So that that got a, a pretty big, uh, was a big deal for the CISO, enough where he told me that in the, in the app brief uh, as, a, as a side story. So have you been able to quantify you know, any type of success uh, anecdotally? And the numbers here point to uh, areas for future improvement. Like um, I think it's safe to say, if it was it if it if it matters, it should be measured or some something. <laughs> like you, you in a corporate environment where you're competing for resources and attention and time, this has got to be part of your program, even if not year one. Is the ability to show successes through you know lower bug count, mean time to fix, uh, wh whatever you agree upon, gamification. Um, you know, you've got to have something. 
Okay, so like I'm going to wrap up and have plenty of time for questions. Uh, there were some interesting things that came out of this. People are still very evangelical, as you might imagine. There's a strong belief in these programs, but I still characterize them as informal, immature, and needing of additional nurturing, to be quite candid, and, and managerial oversight, which is very un, you know, interesting, but it's true. That the ROI, although was mostly anecdotal and you know a case for improvement, and candidly was leaving stuff on the uh, on the table, leaving some, an opportunity there. As I mentioned, a strong uh, observation was that we they had weak managerial mandates across the the the, the companies we uh, surveyed, and that this interesting correlations between the dev app, devs and app six staff and the tooling and maturity. Again, SAS, DAS, and SCA, I think were pretty slick. And like I said, that it was a Herculean effort to grab that data and then make something of it. Uh, if those are, if you're interested in this, please reach out afterwards because I'd like to do this again. I don't know if I'd do it again outside of an app, a pandemic. So it was like a captive audience, uh, and it took probably well hundreds of hours uh, and was pretty pretty much a heavy lift. Uh, there's some other relevance, and I would just add to, to close here, uh, that if, if you're an AppSec manager, leader, security architect, CISO, uh, that you should read, there's an Andy Grove book on, uh, just he's a former C, CEO of Intel about management, and he talks about managerial leverage, which is the concept of doing something once that has just a widespread activity, you know, widespread impact because you're able to get others to do things for you, understanding how to apply that, understanding that you're in a weird way a marketing and sales professional uh, promulgating these programs is, there's a lot of irony in there, but it is, I think, true. The comparative data that came out of this, you can use, uh, particularly as it relates to ratios and to staffing. Um, I think between what we've done and what the other guys have done at Synopsys, I think it's pretty interesting. In order to gain leverage, you should use these incentives. You should, uh, do formalized training, and you should measure your ROI. I mean, there's, I don't, uh, I think you're leaving things on the table if you don't. And uh, like ultimately we're successful, not when we're a gatekeepers or builders or whatever, it's when we get the, our software development brethren and colleagues to view, you know, the security of code as another facet of quality, you know, resiliency, if you want to call it that. And with that, uh, so this is a big deal. There's a lot out there. I hope you've learned something. Uh, I've already got requests to continue to do this type of thing, or maybe even work on a community interest around this topic. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jackie. I think we have plenty of time here for questions.